All right, party people, it's your boy BQ, and we're going to talk Bound for Glory. I know this is happening quite a few days later. I communicated to everyone. I did my absolute best to do it that I was um, going to be out of town for my wedding. So thank you for everyone that sent really, really um, nice and, and positive comments to me and everything. Much, much appreciated. I had one troll. Uh, I don't even know what his name is. I don't know him. He knows me. I don't I don't know him. Uh, but I... I did retweet him on Twitter and gave him a little a little shine. You know, he's he's mad because he plays him plays with himself at night, and that's okay. Um, but we're gonna move right along into this Bound for Glory review. And uh the big question everyone, of course, is asking me is about the return of TNA. And I'll be doing something separate for that tonight. Um, I'm gonna be uh very well prepared for my thoughts. I have very largely uh mainly mostly positive thoughts about this whole TNA thing. There's um, the fan base that seems to be behind it. There's within the podcasting world, a little bit of skepticism, uh, but I'm, I'm actually not on that side. I've, uh, I've got very positive thoughts about the whole TNA thing, but I also like to think that I uh, approach these things a little differently as a normal podcaster, you know? So um, I think, uh, the change aligns with uh, my vision for the company <laughs> as, as a fan. So uh, I will get into that tonight, um, but we're going to talk bound for glory here. And because I was, uh, this happened the day before my wedding, I did not take notes. I was actually kind of having to watch the pay-per-view on my phone as I was doing various different things. I also want to recommend ordering the pay-per-views on the Premier Network. I think that's the name of it. Premier Network. It's a new streaming service. I feel like it's Freddie Prince Jr. or some, something like that. It is a much, much, in my opinion, especially if you're watching on your phone. I don't know if there's like a, how it works. If there's, I don't know if there's a website that you could put up on your laptop or download on a Fire Stick or something. I'm not, I'm not totally sure if there's like a Fire Stick app, but I know for my mobile phone, it is the best app to, to watch these pay-per-views because you can actually minimize the screen as opposed to fight where fight is like, Hey, you have this only, all you can do is watch wrestling on our, on your phone. When you're using our app, we're not going to can't minimize. And uh, I've heard some people say they can minimize. I've never been able to, but I know um, I've had issues with the pay-per-view picking up where it left off when I shut it off. And uh, I mean, don't even, don't even mess with fight, folks. Uh, Premier's the way to go. So let's get into this uh, BFG show. Uh, okay, so let me get this out of the way. Because I have a lot of great things to say about Bound for Glory. Before someone's like, oh, told you so. No. I still stand by the fact that this card was largely thrown together. That the build was doo-doo. I, st I stand by that. That there's minimal buzz around it. Okay. I stand by that. That being said, if Impact, and, and maybe we're getting there with the whole announcement of TNA and, and leading up to Hard to Kill, if Impact can create an environment where the build and the buzz match the actual product, sky's the freaking limit. Because most of the pay-per-views, whoa, most of the pay-per-views that Impact does are good. I would say 80% are good. There's people who argue, say it's 100%. I'm not one of those. But I do think 80% of the shows are very, very good. And that includes the Impact Plus shows, which who knows what they're going to call that now. I mean, the show's still going to be Impact. So I think you could get away with calling it Impact Plus personally, but whatever. Not my, not my thing. But if they can match... If they, if they can if they can create a build and a buzz that matches the actual output, I mean the growth that they would show. It's like people people telling me. I mean, I always say you know I'm a very big WNBA fan. You know, I have people tell me I didn't even know the finals were on. Well, yeah, you 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 typically don't know these things. Like I just learned that hockey was going on. Okay. And that I live in the same city as the champs. So my point is when there's something that you don't follow, you rarely know what the hell they're doing. And I think there was a, a large portion of the wrestling world that really had no clue Bound for Glory was going on. That's why I was kind of critical, and I am going to pull back on this a little bit. Stay tuned. 
But that's why I was a little critical about Speedball Mike Bailey being the opponent for Will Ospreay. I said there's very, very minimal buzz in that. In the Impact bubble, yes. But outside of the Impact bubble, I thought Will Ospreay was their one opportunity on the card to grab those people who don't typically watch the product. And I still stand by that. I will pull back on it a little bit. But I think if they could just get to a point where you're building this show and it's, you know, not everything has to be this incredible build, build, incredible build not every single thing on the match. But if it's an engaging build, engaging storylines, social media is not posting nonsense like they do. Uh, I think we can really get there. I think we can see a lot of growth in, in 2024 because I don't think the TNA name itself is going to grow the company. I still think it's uh, you know, a shift in mindset, a shift in thinking, um, a shift in approach overall, but let's, let's uh, enough talking about all that. Let's talk. Um, let's talk BFG. Very good show. Very, very good show. Again, I stand by everything I said about the build and the buzz. I stand by that. Very good show. Uh, top to bottom, really, really solid. And I even said when I was previewing and, and all that, I, I expect it to be a good show. They usually put on good shows. It's um, Bound for Glory is the one that when they when they do miss, they miss a Bound for Glory. Um, and I, I saw people you know, posting graphics of the last like uh eight bound for glory main events and and i was like man there were some stinkers on that you know stinkers of a card over the last eight ten years and uh you know one of the truly positive things is that i believe last year and this year are the first two years that bound for glory's main event has not included someone from the wwe uh, you know, they kind of did it with the Knockouts Championship, obviously, but the men's title, if you go back to just as, you know, ob- obviously there's a, a stopping point, the early days of TNA, they had their own roster, okay? But, you know, I think let's be realistic here. Let's go back eight years, ten years, look at the main event, and it, and it, it's always, oh, well, this guy was in WWE, and he may not even work for the freaking company for impact. You know what I mean? He might be there for a few matches, but they have put these people, the Alberto Del Rios and Johnny impacts and uh, Matt Hardy's. And, and, and I understand some of those people were signed. I'm not saying they're all short term, but um, just, just, just look at it. You know, the last two years uh, they have started to throw the homegrown impact talents into the main event. And that's what I think they need to do for bound for glory and especially moving forward with the with the whole rebrand and everything i think that is a uh, a very good thing so uh, the actual um show itself kicks off with chris saban versus Anta. and um this was the first of the championship matches of the evening. The knockouts tag team title match was completely bumped from the show. It was recorded for main event Monday or whatever, whatever they do that nobody watches. I was really disappointed because I had a lot of interest in that match. I would imagine that uh killer Kelly and Masha Slamovich won because I haven't heard anything otherwise. I, I would imagine they did. But um, I think that was, even though it was a thrown together match, I had a lot of interest in it. I'm very disappointed it wasn't on the card. This was much different than Slammiversary, where Slammiversary featured a lot of title changes, pretty much every single title change except the main event. This was very, very different as far as Bound for Glory goes. But it kicks off and we had Chris Sabin versus Kenta. And, you know, I think this was my favorite match on the card. And, you know, for the sake of not repeating myself too much, I've never been into flips and dives and and no selling. And um, that is not wrestling that I enjoy personally. So this, I I think this was something of, um, you know, it gave you a little bit of that, but it wasn't that it didn't, uh, you know, because Chris Saban was in the match, obviously, but it didn't dominate the story. You know that they still showed that they could uh, they could really work. And 
know, Kenta was never going to win this match. We know he wasn't. And, you know, I, I think also when it comes to the build, the difference between this and, and Mike Bailey versus Will Ospreay is that at least we got some kind of like video packages or something promoting this on the weekly show. We really, you know, we really got minimal uh, effort on the television show put into Bailey and Osprey as opposed to this. Like we got, we got a little something here. Uh, and I, you know, there, there was always a good chance it was going to kick off the show. The kickoff is a weird spot for impact though, because they typically put a match here that they feel is going to get people hyped up and into the show. But it also, it also risks the wrestlers being, you know, performing like trained seals. And I, I guess what I'm saying is um, they're just kind of wrestling to entertain the audience instead of telling a real story in the ring, which has I, I'm not saying that wasn't the, was the case with this match, but there's been some matches in the past where it's almost like I can't even take it seriously because I feel like it's just there for entertainment purposes. You know, these multi-person X Division matches and things of that nature. But I think this one here was a really good way of starting out the show. Like people cared about it. Um, I think they cared who won and who won and didn't win. Because one of my other critiques of the show was no one cared who won majority of these matches. You know what I mean? So and I, and I and I think I threw this one into that category when I was doing the preview. But you know, for the most part, I do think uh, a lot of the Impact fans wanted to see Chris Saban. Uh, defend even though there was bullet club fans there i mean chris saban win the match even though there's bullet club fans there obviously but uh, i think it was my favorite match of the show very entertaining just great you know x division style match without unnecessary rolling and flipping and diving uh they you know they told a little bit of a story too because the guys can work so i enjoyed it quite a bit um what do we have to after this i hope that i'm going in order here because i'm using this website, and I feel like this wasn't the second match, but I, I could be completely wrong. Let me just double check. Oh, we're going to get into it. And it was Monsters Ball. It was Rhino versus PCO versus Moose versus Steve Macklin. Uh, when I was doing my preview, I completely forgot to review this match or to preview it, I should say. So I did a, you know, a bit of a separate, separate upload on it for my cell phone. I hate, I hate having to record there. Monsters Ball. So everyone, everyone knows the no DQ, the street fights, uh, all that shit. You guys know my feelings on it. They're done to death with Impact. Impact has pulled back on it a little bit in 2023. Like 2022 was every every other episode. They've pulled back on it a little bit, probably because AEW does it every single fucking week, and uh, you know. They're kind of like, we probably don't need to deliver these kind of matches on a regular basis. But uh, I also said when I was doing my little preview that this match probably had the best story, in my opinion. Uh, because, I, and maybe it was done by accident, but just the fact that Steve Macklin was kind of the centerpiece of this whole thing. Moose got his briefcase. He took out Rhino once upon a time. I have no clue what PCO's inclusion into all this was he just randomly showed up one episode and Tom Hannafin, yours PCO. Um, I hope he did the drinking game, by the way, of a first, first time ever matchup, take a shot. Uh, Cause it was the very first thing that Tom Hannafin said to kick off the show. And then he said it a second time after the show was over. I mean, after the match was over um, about a different match. So um, it, it's, Tom Hannafin would definitely knock you on your ass. If you play the impact drinking game, but um, monsters ball here, I I actually kind of enjoyed this. I thought um, you know, I thought Moose coming to the ring with pajama pants on was was kind of funny, but also like kind of odd because it was the complete opposite of what people normally do for these matches, right? They you know they they kind of show up in jeans or show up in a t shirt or something that's supposed to. Who I don't even understand the thinking. <laughs> with how people normally dress for these matches. Uh, but he came in like pajama pants or something. Uh, I, you know, I've also said that the Monsters Ball, Monsters Balls matches, Monster Balls, Monsters Ball matches seem to be a little more entertaining than the average like street fight and all that that they do. 
it showed him locking him, you know, locking him in the room with no food or water for 24 hours, whatever it do. It's very, very silly, but at the same time, it's something different. Um, <laughs> just, I don't know the way they all stepped out, like covering their eyes and all that. It's just, it's unreal. It's, it's, it's very unrealistic. Like you cannot, um, you, you cannot throw someone out to do a sporting event that has not had new proper hydration and nutrition for 24 hours. Like that's just, you just can't do that. Um, but no, but I, I thought for the most part, this was okay. I, I think it was a little bit more of an impact television match, but as I said, it's had a little bit of a story to it on a show that didn't have a lot of storytelling as far as the build and the creative went. So I, you know, I was, I was a little interested in it. Um, my ball shriveled to the size of absolute raisins though, when PCO won. So I'm not a huge PCO fan. I know the impact fans like him quite a bit. I was, I was actually kind of happy that he didn't resign. Uh, but now he has resigned. So, I mean, I, I, I appreciate the commitment to the character. He's just not, I don't particularly like enjoy the gimmick. Uh, I think if he was not thrown into main event matches and, and I, I, I tend to, I tend to shy away from wrestlers who become crutches for a company where it's like, Oh, we need a world title opponent. What, what the fuck are we going to do? Oh, PCO. Uh, we need a surprise opponent. Uh, PCO. Like it's almost the Tommy dreamer role a little bit. It's almost the, the, uh, P.D. Williams role, you know, just just like break glass in case of emergency type of wrestler, which they're doing that with Rhino as well. But I don't know. I I, I just tend to not be huge fans of of, of guys in that role. Um, I don't like the walking around yelling people's names and everything like that's I just don't like it. And that's OK, because a lot of you do. So that's perfectly fine. But um, I mean, my nuts just shriveled when, when he won this match because he was the one who just wasn't even involved in the fucking storyline. And when he won, that told me that he was resigned. I knew, I knew at that point that, that he was back and I just don't think he needed the win. I think it was unnecessary. I think they felt like he needed to win because it's his style match, but, but the guys who needed the momentum out of here were Moose and Steve Macklin. And you could have even made a point for Rhino to win uh, to get a little come up and on Steve Macklin, I wouldn't have wanted that, but I'm saying you could have made a point for it. And I, and I thought the finish where Moose clearly pulled the the chair onto himself, so PCO could PCO salt onto it. I just I didn't like the finish. I didn't like the PCO winning. But again, for the most part, it, it was pretty good. Um, they got Bully Ray in there when he said, "Who's soft now?" And he threw Macklin. Or he pushed them off the top rope. He was supposed to land onto the barbed wire table, and he got about 20% of it, and the rest of his body hit the ground, which uh, was pretty pretty gnarly to see. So um, hopefully he's, he's okay. But, of course, me personally as a C. Macklin guy, I wanted him to win. He did. I mean, I, mean, I, I don't see why. Oh, well, I guess I can see why C. Macklin doesn't win because he had building with something with him and Bully Ray. And I'll, I'll talk about that feud again a little bit when we get to the Call Your Shot Gauntlet. And then, uh, so after this here, we had the Impact World Tag Team Championship match. The ABC, I wish I would call them the Ace and Bay Club or Ace and Bay Connection, but whatever. The ABC versus the Rascals. Uh, this was, <laughs> people might think I'm a little crazy. This was my least favorite match on the show. I think that even though I think the rascals are doing awesome work, I think these two teams are just so interchangeable. Uh, They've wrestled a few times. They didn't bring anything different to this that they normally, uh, that they normally do. And I think that's the reason it was my least favorite. Like I've just, you know, they did their thing. I'm not, I'm not going to take anything away from them. Lord knows I could not do this shit. Okay. I can barely roll out of bed half the mornings at fucking 44 years old. Trust me. Okay. But, um, I just don't think anything happened here that we hadn't seen before from them. Um, I, I even said when I was doing my preview that I was fairly certain it was going to, you know, the, the finish was going to be 
the rascals taking spray paint to the eyes because that was the story they've been telling this entire time that they do to their opponents to cheat. So I thought it was like really obvious that that's where they were going to go with it. Um, you know, it was just a very low hanging fruit. It was just just easy way to end the match and then to continue it and to, for these two teams to fight forever. And I just don't really want to see them fight forever. Tag teams that I like in wrestling. And and this the, these guys all fall into the same category as of, of the flipping and diving and all that shit. Okay, that I I say I'm not a big fan of. I don't I don't like rehearsed obviously rehearsed wrestling matches. For me, when I'm watching a tag team match, I like the teams that have the powerhouse and then kind of have the guy who who's the worker. You know, obviously at my age, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up teams like the Hart Foundation or and, and something like that. Like. I, I enjoy wrestling like that to where you kind of get a contrast in styles. And I like to see the contrast in styles with the opponents and the, and the team, the, the teams themselves, if that makes sense. These four guys all wrestle the exact same way. And for those who enjoy the X division style and who enjoy the modern tag team wrestling, like this was a great match. I will not take anything away from what they did. For me personally, I just kind of felt like they they didn't really show us anything that they wouldn't show us on an episode of Impact. And I expect to see this match over and over going forward. That's that's the way, you know, the way I see it. So um Hannafin actually mentioned that Wentz and Miguel, Wentz and Miguel are undefeated as a tandem dating back four years. So not, you know, obviously we had different versions of the rascals. They usually wrestled in, in, in six man matches. And, and we had a Desmond Xavier at one point, but as a team as a two of them undefeated as a tandem in, in four years. So that's a, um, that's pretty, pretty interesting. So the ABC wins the match. I mean, they've been tag team champions champions before. I just don't see what they're going to bring to the division that they haven't already done. Um, you know, but, but, Hey, if people are into it, people are into it. That's just me as a fan. Not my cup of tea. Speedball Mike Bailey versus Will Ospreay. So this is going down as potentially the best match in Impact Wrestling history. And it was excellent. I said I would pull back on it a little bit because I was really, really critical of, about Mike Bailey being his opponent because I think uh, he's still a bit of a mystery in the wrestling world. I don't think he's, you know, outside of the impact bubble, I think he's, you know, I've never seen anyone talk about him. The only thing I've ever seen was a video of him going around doing the ultimate weapon and people saying what a dangerous move that is. And it is. And um, this was a first time ever matchup that was presented by Imperatus, which looks awful, by the way, which most of the movies that, uh, most all the movies that impact has sponsored these matches look horrible. Um, but that's, that's, you know, that's where impact is. Maybe when they get to the TNA level, maybe the sponsorship improves a little bit, you know what I mean? Um, but we're going to, we're going to talk about that tonight. So this match here, uh, will Osprey came out looking, feeling like an absolute star. He's not going to sign with impact wrestling folks. I am, Let's just get that out there right now. He is posturing. He is, I'm sure, really enjoying his time. He said some really thing, positive things about the company. He is not signing with Impact. He's part of the Don Callis family in AEW, which he can also do if he decides to stay in New Japan. He is not going to. They are putting him against, arguably, their top three guys in his first three matches. What would he possibly do after that? He is not signing. Okay, so let's stop it. But anyway, this match here, this really delivered. Everyone was, you know, I I can't think of anyone who who wasn't overly impressed by this. I think it. I mean, should delivered it. It really over delivered. And as I said, I was going to pull back a little bit on what I said because I think Will Osprey ended up being the perfect opponent. I think that Will Ospreay was, a, well, I mean, I know he was supposed to fight Mike Bailey at Multiverse United 2, I believe it was, but he got injured and couldn't do it. And I'm always saying, okay, Impact stays the course. They stay the course. Um, but, you know, maybe that was the right, the right thing to do here. Like Mike Bailey was supposed to be the first opponent. They feel that he, he, uh, 
he earned that, you know, with, with good goodwill within the company. So, you know, they wanted to to stay the course and say, hey, we're, we're going to give Mike Bailey the first crack at Will Ospreay. I just don't think it sold the pay-per-views, you know, that the needed necessary pay-per-views. I think it's a match people might go back and watch now because now the buzz is there. It's just after the fact is the problem. So they're going to look around on the Internet. Uh, we'll see what Meltzer gives this thing. Um, so, you know, I still kind of stand by if you have Will Ospreay and he's just wrestled Okada, Omega, and Jericho, like you can't give him Mike Bailey at, Bailey after that. But maybe they're just in a difficult place because that's really who they wanted to be his first opponent. They needed to be a beatable opponent because he's sticking around for a little bit. I, I kind of get it. So I'm not going to be as critical of it. I think they were just kind of in a, in a difficult place there. You know, I would have put him in the main event. Personally, I would have had him wrestling in one way, shape, or form for the world title. That just that's just me personally because he's not going to be around. If he was like signing and going to stick around for a year for six months, then I might I might say, okay, you know what, put him versus Mike Bailey. But he's he's not. So, but this match was you know this was everything everyone hoped it would be. Crowd loved it. The internet loved it. Everything. I mean, it is. I, I had said at one point this year that Impact will not put on a better match than Josh Alexander versus Rich Swan, and I was very positive in saying that. This match is, um, and and people may not agree that's the match of the year. I I did when it was when it happened, even though it happened very early in the year. I was like, "Yo, this is this is it. They they cannot do no one. <laughs> oh, my cats are fighting. No one is outdoing this for Impact the rest of the year." You know, I I, I truly uh, truly felt that. But this this blew that away. This blew that away. And there's actually been a couple matches Impact has had in the last couple months that have just been really, really good. So the the in-ring Impact product, I hope it's it I hope it's uh traveling through word of mouth that that they just put on great matches. There's no kicking out of 50 near falls and no selling everything and and uh you know needing super finishers to beat somebody. So I've got I I do have a couple critiques is not the right word because as I said I can never do this shit but but I'm gonna say I'm gonna say I got a couple critiques or a couple maybe not critiques but there was a couple things I I I didn't like there was a little bit of no selling which for me you can never justify that <laughs> and maybe it's just my age you just cannot I can't justify no selling like. I could be um, laying on the ground and my 10 year old could jump off the stairs from about two or three feet up and land on me. And I, I'm going to be in a lot of pain. You know what I'm saying? So I, I sometimes some of the moves that they, that they take, I can't uh, obviously, I, obviously I can't relate to it. I'm talking about my 10 year old hurting me. I just, I can't, I can never justify no selling the finish, the finish of the match as well took, Will Osprey hitting multiple finishers. And this is not something Impact really does. AEW does it a lot. And for me, it it provides a cold finish rather than hitting the finisher and the crowd being behind it and then getting the one, two, three. When you hit the finisher, the crowd's, oh, here, here it comes. And he kicks out and then you pick up the guy and do it again. You've, you've just sucked all the heat out of it, and it's a cold finish. And the double finisher, the triple finisher, that is the new top rope finisher, the new super finisher. So, you know, we've had points in wrestling where I think we've dialed back on a little bit where finishers just can't, can't beat anybody. So then you got to hit the finisher off the second rope. Then you got to hit it off the top rope. And then you got to do it through a table and onto a car and all this shit. Dialed back from that a little bit in wrestling, but now hitting two finishers, three finishers in a row, that is the new, like you would do in a video game. That is the new super finisher. And I'm I'm never really, really big on that because, as I said, it just, it just sucks the heat out of the match. It, it just, it, you get, it gives you a cold finish. Um, So that was my only thing, you know, with the end, but everything that they did, during the match, it was like it was like 
it wasn't like AEW where it's balls to the wall through the whole pay per view and they've they've done everything. By the time you get to the main event, you've already seen everything. Like these guys just did shit that no one was even capable of doing in the other matches. So it just it just really it really stood out. But this was, you know, I hate to give star ratings, but <laughs> it's a five star match. It's a six star match. I believe Melter gives out six star matches now. So I would imagine that uh this is gonna be one of those six star matches and he's gonna go on to wrestle and will osprey that is josh alexander and eddie edwards and i expect those to be really really good as well is it gonna live up to this i don't know i don't know we'll see it's gonna be interesting to see how they book will osprey versus josh alexander i just don't see will osprey losing to someone in impact impact wrestling i don't i could see a time limit draw with josh alexander and then beating Eddie Edwards. So I don't know. But yes, what you know, what can I say about this? Excellent match. Probably the best match in Impact Wrestling history. First time ever matchup. All right. So call your shot gauntlet. This had Jake something, Eddie Edwards, Kenny King, who've been to Guerrero, who was one of the surprise entrants, which I thought was a complete fart in church. Uh, Johnny Swinger, Giselle Shaw, Jody Threat, Colin King, Sonny Kiss. Uh, didn't see that one coming. Bully Ray, Matt Cardona, Jordan Grace, Eric Young, Joe Hendry, Brian Myers, Heath, Frankie Gazarian, Rich Swan, Jonathan Gresham, Dirty Dango. So we got no, no big time debut here. Everyone was positive someone was showing up here. I think the realists, the Impact realists, did not expect CM Punk here. I think the Impact delusional thought CM Punk was going to be here. Um, there was no way you're de- debuting CM Punk versus the Call Your Shot Gauntlet. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. There's no, no way in, in, in fucking hell. But they usually give us something, right? They usually give us some kind of big debut here, and they, they really didn't. They didn't build this show on. You know, I'm saying AEW again, but AEW builds a lot of their shows on who's going to show up. And then when no one shows up, it sucks the life out of the building. And that can be a tricky area to walk because fans do want to see debuts. But if you condition them that it's always this, you know, it's got to be a debut that's going to blow them out the water. And then you don't do it the next month or the next pay-per-view. It, you know, people will look back at the show and be like, well, this show sucked. But with Impact, we're always hoping we, we get something, right? We're always hoping someone chooses Impact. I always talk about someone being the next Kurt Angle, someone who chooses Impact, doesn't settle for Impact, chooses. So we, we always want to know, is, is this pay-per-view going to be the, the pay-per-view? Like, So even Trinity, I mean, does anyone really think Trinity was like, hey, Impact's the place for me? You You understand what I'm saying? Uh, but we didn't get anything like that here. Uh, we did get Sunny Kiss. I actually like Sunny Kiss. I've, I, I wouldn't say I'm a, a fan necessarily, but his, her, whatever you want to say, character is so different than anything else out. I'm always, I'm always okay with different. That's why even like with PCO, like I don't like PCO, but he's different. So I, I appreciate what he brings to the Impact product because there's nothing else like him, and there's definitely nothing like Sunny Kiss. I know we got Jay Vidal running around, and I'm sure they're going to have some interesting uh, dialogue, <laughs> you know. But um, but that was the main surprise here. The other surprise we got was Matt Cardona. We've seen him 50 million times. the The sheer amount of people wearing red in this match was driving me crazy. So I actually appreciated Brian Myers and Cardona, and I someone else that were rocking the yellow. So. I like that quite a bit, but it's a call your shot gone. They have progressively done a better job with this as the years pass. My problem is that the 20 number 20 spot continues to be a joke spot. It was the spot where Shira got eliminated immediately. It was the spot where, um, uh, her nan daddy self eliminated to go chase the wad of twenties that I think Falaba had. And you keep putting them in these matches where the winner is number 20. They they have done it from the very beginning. I think with Eddie and Shira, they actually had a one-on-one match, and I think Shira beat them. 
So it it continues to be a joke spot, and we're supposed to invest in these bullshit, you know, we're going to have a five-on-five five matchup, and then the winners are going to fight each other, and who the fuck cares, right? Because number one won two years in a row, so it's not that much of a disadvantage. It's really not that much of a disadvantage because this isn't like the Royal Rumble with two minutes in between. It is 20 people with one minute in between, and I question if, if even a minute passed between some of these entrants. There were wrestlers who got in the ring, and they did not take a minute to walk down fucking 30 feet. The entrance hit, they entered the ring, and the countdown started again. You're not going to tell me that a minute passed. I don't care. I know the min- a minute is not the longest amount of time, but people were not taking a minute to get down to the ring. I am sorry. But as I said, they have continually um, done better and better with this match every year. The trophy was a beast. This was not the number one dad Father's Day trophy, number one employee bullshit trophy that they just swapped the plates out on with the that uh, X Division. Whatever, I forgot what it was, the, uh, the X Division trophy. It's the same fucking trophy. They just switched the plates. It was embarrassing. It was like, um, if you saw the meme that went around last year, the WNBA's uh, All-Star Trophy was <laughs> just this Kelsey Plummet one, and she was just holding it, and it's just tiny, and it just got roasted on the internet, which now their trophy was huge this year. They didn't make that mistake, but Impact for about three or four years had these bullshit fucking trophies that look like shit. Now it's like something really prestigious looking to win this thing. This was very, um, a very interesting match because I was positive. I said in my reviews, my previews, I'm sorry. This was the year a knockout was going to win. This was the year Jordan Grace was going to win. People were positive Jake something was win this, going to win this thing. And I said, dude, number one is not winning again. I promise. Number one is always going to be there in the end. I've, I think they've established that. But he was not going to win. Jake something doesn't even have a – he comes to the ring and, you know, um, Pender just says, coming to the ring, Jake something. That's not what he said. I would start using my Tom Hannafin voice there. Jake something. He doesn't say this motherfucker is from whatever, wherever, you know, Tickle Dick, Michigan. He weighs this many pounds. He just, I mean, he doesn't even have the entrance of a star, dude. He he was not winning this thing. He's coming back and his push has been a lot better. He looks like he's going to have a better run and impact this time around. He was not winning. But I felt that this was the uh, the final, not the final opportunity, but your best opportunity for a knockout to win because the knockouts involved in this were, you know, obviously Giselle Shaw was in it. Um, and Jody Threat's a little smaller too, but when you got Kylan King in there, you got Jordan Grace, you can make it work where the knockouts last a little longer in the match. The very first one, you know, had you had Alicia Edwards. She goes in. Someone just throws her off the, over the top rope right away. You know, you were able to get around it this time. Uh, I thought Juventu Guerrero was a complete fucking fart in church. But there's always a, uh, I don't want to call him a joke, but there's always a joke entrant also. And I guess maybe Johnny Swinger was that. What I want to say that was like really positive about this match is that I think this is the first year outside of like, I mean, realistically, outside of her John uh, Juventud Guerrero, Johnny Swinger, probably Giselle Shaw and Jody Threat as well. Outside of those guys, you could have made a a case for any of these people to win the match. All right, so Eddie Edwards, Kenny King, Kylan King, Sonny Kiss, Bully Ray, Matt Cardona. Jordan Grace, Eric Young, Joe Hendry, Brian Myers, Heath, Frankie Gazarian, Rich Swan, Jonathan Gresham. Oh, and Dirty Dango was never going to win. And and to go back to what I said about the joke spot, he was eliminated in about five seconds after we went through that whole fucking nonsense five on five, broken into a five way match, all that waste of our fucking time. So you are wasting our time, Impact, with the number 20 thing. But to go back to what I just said, any of these people could have won the match. You know, there was you could have made a case for any of them and and been fairly happy with the result, I think. 
So uh, Jordan Grace wins this thing. She beats Bully Ray, and it it furthers the storyline with Steve Macklin that Bully Ray has gone soft because he has just lost to a girl in the ring. It, it was perfect. He was the perfect person to lose this match, especially because he won last year. So this was excellent. And yet I wasn't really big about the dance off he had with Sonny Kiss, but that's whatever. They're clearly building towards Sonny Kiss versus Giselle Shaw immediately. They're just going to jump right into it. So I, it's one of those things that's not, it's not going to be a big feud, but you, you, you can tell a little bit of a story with that. That's the only Sunny Kiss match on the roster that makes any kind of fucking sense. If, if he's going to be there going forward, the only match that makes perfect sense is him versus Giselle Shaw, and they're probably going to do it on the next episode of Impact. But Jordan Grace wins. Um, with and, and like I said, this this trophy is a beast. It clearly clearly we're not going to have her just carry it around. So she just called her shot. I predicted that she was going to call it against the world title or the world champion, but it is going to be a knockouts champion. And that's another thing. Impact staying the course. Like they wanted Jordan Grace versus Trinity. They're going to make it happen. And uh, but that's fine. I had no problem with with her calling it for January because now this gives them an opportunity to build it a little bit. I think it'll be Trinity's last match in Impact. I think they'll drop the title and she'll be done. Speaking of Trinity, she took on Mickey James' Knockouts Championship match. Uh, this wasn't super good. I didn't expect it to be. The two of them have enough star power to where you're still invested in the match. You know, uh, even though I'm I'm gonna say, hey, it wasn't that good. I knew it wasn't gonna be good. I don't think either of them are that good individually. It was okay. This wasn't about putting on a world-class wrestling match. This was about the two biggest stars on the show having a match. And I put, I say two biggest stars over Will Ospreay because Will Ospreay never went through the WWE system. You know, within the hardcores, obviously he's extremely popular. But when you're talking about casual wrestling fans and people who only watch WWE, like this is it right here. This was this was one of the matches that I think they were trying to sell pay-per-views with uh but it was it was it was okay it was really what i expected it was going to be uh the 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 finish i thought the tap out i thought was a little cold as well i don't think it was uh i don't think they built up to it quite enough i don't think people even knew she tapped out (laughs) you know um, and they and they've got this thing where trinity's tapping out all the knockouts and then she's going to be gone in a few months and and we're just going to have a bunch of Bunch of chicks standing around holding their tits like, okay, we all lost to Trinity. Um, they got Trinity. Man, I cannot believe at the this UK taping or whatever, they're feeding Giselle Shaw to Trinity again. How many times are they going to wrestle and how many times is Giselle Shaw going to lose to Trinity? How many times is Giselle Shaw going to lose? I've never seen someone have so many opportunities wrestling the knockouts champion title match or non-title match as freaking Giselle Shaw. Absolutely insane. And then um then they're feeding Deanna Perazzo to Trinity again at turning point. I swear to God if she makes Deanna tap again, I will lose my my shit. Anyway, uh this match was again as, as exactly what I expected, cold finish. They're going to take several months to build Trinity versus Jordan Grace. Jordan Grace is probably going to beat her, and J- Trinity will probably leave the company after that. That is at least what I think it is. And they they, they had a pretty good baby face versus baby face match here, I thought. They tease a little bit like what's next for Mickey James. Mickey James can't just stick around at this point, just keep wrestling for the knockouts championship. Her husband's not around, so she can't do anything with him. What are they going to do with her? I hope she sticks around. I don't want her to go anywhere. I do like her. So we'll see. We'll see what happens with Mickey James. Hopefully it's not, you know, retirement shit. Hopefully they're not, she's not trying to go join her husband in WWE. They want her on screen with him as like an authority figure couple, I believe. I hope they don't do that. I hope that Mickey James allows Nick Aldis to do his own thing and shine in his own way and not be in her shadow at all. 
So I hope that she doesn't do that. I would just like to see her stick around it. Not with the fake accent, just the normal Mickey James talking, but you know, we love her in this company. So I want her to stick around. And the main event was Josh Alexander versus Alex Shelley impact world championship match. I was very, very confident in saying Alex Shelley was going to win this. I thought that they, when they released these turning point graphics, which they, you know, they, they bust their load very quickly on this kind of stuff. You could have promoted probably with the same, same effect turning point. As soon as Baffer glory was over, I don't think, uh, you know, a few days before the pay-per-view, they needed to let us know that Josh was going to team up with Eric young against job culture. Like, random ass match you're going to tell me the world champion is wrestling that random ass match and then on the flip side you had alex shelley i think it was motor sim machine guns against um moose and brian myers moose you we already know moose is the de facto number one contender for the title alex shelley as the non-champion was not going to be wrestling fucking moose like they they gave away these freaking finishes and of course the people on 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 x we're saying, oh, well, they can just, you know, they're not giving away the finish. They can always change the graphic. They gave away the fucking finish with the matches. It was not about the graphic. Obviously, they can change a graphic. I can change one of my graphics in, in seconds that I do. But what they were booking for the matches told us what the finish was going to be. And they have done this more often than not. Sometimes they throw us off a little bit more often than not when they start announcing these matches as matches well ahead of time we know what the finish is going to be and this match here was um you know i'm not going to get into it because it wasn't one that i i necessarily cared a lot about it's because they just both bore me i thought that they did a very good job though in the build i thought the build was going to be complete shit up to this i thought they did a pretty decent job with it with you know you give Shelly, like, you know, heel tendencies and, and start, you start to, to, to build some heat. Josh Alexander as the golden, he's the golden boy of impact, right? Like this guy doesn't lose. And he lost here. Alex Shelley beat him. And he sold those shell shocks like a champ. Took two on the head. Again, it was two finishers to beat the guy. You're ice cold at that point. Just if he would have just planted him with that first one, hooked the leg and got it, place would have erupted. And now we're starting to do that. We need two finishers to win the match. It buries your finisher when you can't beat him in one. That's the problem. But Josh Alexander doesn't lose ever. He's, I think he's getting dangerously close to being the Hulk Hogan of this company. And I think him losing here, and by by that, I just mean when he just beats everybody, at one point you just get completely bored with it and you start cheering for him to lose. By him losing here, I think they actually, the way he, I mean, took those shell shocks planted directly on his head, I think he, he, he started building some sympathy that he's never been able to garner before. The only time they've been able to get any kind of Sympathy on Josh Alexander is when they bring his wife in. That is the crutch. That is the impact crutch is the wife. You bring the wife in when when the champion needs some sympathy or the heel needs some heat. And they didn't do that this time around. But they managed to, I think, in defeat, have some we, we now have some sympathy for Josh Alexander. We've only ever known him as a as a babyface single to be wrestling for championships. Now, you know, he's not going to be in the world title picture. He's not going to go wrestle for the X Division Championship again. He's in a position now where they have to find, instead of him just going having these good matches on television, they're going to have to find a meaningful feud for him. And I think that's going to do more for Josh Alexander than him winning the title back right away or him being champion, period. I think it's not a chase because he's not going to be chasing him belt, but it's the road back to the main event. So I think it keep an eye on who is this next feud is because, because this could be um, this could be what really allows him to grow as a character and not be so bland and not so be so boring and 
tell us the same shit in the promos and here i'm just gonna scratch and claw and work real hard like fuck you we don't I, i'm done with all that give us something meaningful to sink sink our teeth into as far as a storyline regarding josh alexander all right so alex shelley wins I guess he's wrestling Moose at Hard to Kill. I think that's where they're going with it. I don't think they're doing a cash in type of thing. I think I think they may have um, announced it or alluded to it. I don't I don't know. But that's it for me, guys. Uh, that's it for me talking Bound for Glory. It is very early here. I wanted to do this last night, but uh, my kids were being very loud, and it wasn't an option for me. So I had to wake up nice and early before work today to knock this out. And again, I'm going to do a separate upload talking about my thoughts on TNA. It is it is largely positive. I think you guys will dig it. I think I make some really, really good points. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of people just like, oh, I, I don't see why they're what's the point of going back to this? I see the point. I see I see the the bigger picture. So we're going to talk about that tonight. Thanks for checking me out. As always, folks, I am your boy BQ. I'm out. Peace. <laughs>